It's looking perfect. Awesome. Do you want to just go ahead and get into the agenda for us? Sure. Uh, so during part one of today's session, we're going to be talking about service learning, doing a brief overview of service learning, of GivePulse, its benefits, and uh, the expectations that we have around using it. Then we'll actually get into doing a walkthrough of GivePulse. I think this will be really useful. We'll go into the system. Uh, share some guides that we'll make publicly available after today's workshop and show you for teaching a community-based course, how would you apply uh, GivePulse as a software or as a tool to help with teaching your course? And then lastly, we're gonna be discussing what's next in terms of the CV process for the year. So we'll have a brief discussion in terms of what are ways that we can support you around your annual report. Um, also talk about upcoming events that we have and then any questions or troubleshooting that would be useful for us to know in ahead of time as we start this semester. So over this first part, we're going to do an overview of CB teaching, explain what is Gift Pulse, and again, go through the benefits. So community-based teaching is uh, we can go to the next slide. Community-based teaching is an approach that will actually use these two videos to ex explain. And uh, we might need to share with sound as we do the screen share. No problem for me. Double check one. Okay, what about now? I'm still not hearing it. I wonder if clicking on the link itself, it is embedded, so I'm not sure. And I don't know um, if that's something Victoria could help out with. Well, I, know we're having... I, I can hear it from my end, so it must be on the on the screen share side of things. So there we go. Let's see if this fixes it. There we go. Yeah, we can hear it now. is usually a, a bit of sound with this video. There we go. It's kind of going in and out. Uh, we can pause this one and actually move to the next one. Okay. Live it and experience it. If this class wasn't a surface learning class, I think it would have been one of those classes where you just learn a bunch of statistics and like you might hear a story or two, which is kind of like sad, but you'll, you'll forget about it. It's. A Are you happy here? Or do you want to start from the beginning? Yes. To the beginning? No, uh, no, just where, where it was embedded to start. Okay. Very exciting thing for the students. And, and it gets more exciting as the course goes along, as they have more and more experiences of actually interacting with people who have lived experiences that relate to the subject matter they're reading. They're teaching you just as much as you're teaching them. The, what you're reading actually jumps out of the page. If you, if you can connect it to something you've actually seen. It broadens the students' scopes, horizons, um, perspectives, and makes them think about community on such a micro and a macro level, which I think is essential for change. Like, I remember just leaving class and just feeling like, oh my goodness, like, I really want to do something to change this. A service learning class will definitely change your perspective about a lot of things that you might be learning in your traditional classes. It really helped me develop a, a very critical eye towards what I was reading in the news, uh, how I understood current events. Service learning is why I chose my major. Service learning is why I'm in 
my master's program. I would say that all of them come out of it um, stronger activists, stronger advocates, uh, stronger allies. Um, I don't think I know anyone that went in that class, especially in my year, that isn't still in some way involved in the world of social justice. I mean, we've had students look at us and say, I will remember this moment the rest of my life. And that's a whole different kind of learning. Okay, uh, we can move on to the next slide. So, Hi, my name is Melina Price. I You're sorry about that. There we go. No worries. Uh, so from the last video, one of the things we were hoping to show is just the impact that service learning or community-based learning, as it's also called, has on the students itself. So as we look at how students react to the practice of community-based learning, we notice that it kind of fits with what the Gen Z uh, almost ideology or approach to learning is. Gen Z ends up being more tech savvy. They're seeking real, real world experiences, ways to connect uh, what they're doing in class to ways that they can change the world. When it comes to American University students specifically, we're one of the most politically active universities and community-based learning is a great way to leverage that to become uh, deeper and more cognizant of socio-political issues. It's also a great professional development tool. It provides students a chance to not only get their kind of um, feet wet and hands dirty with practice of what they're learning in class and see if they like it, if they wanna practice that in the future, but it also provides an extra layer and element to uh, what's kind of reading, what they're reading on the page. and. That was that's something that we see very consistently when we get feedback from students and collect stories from them throughout our service learning programs. So on the next slide, we're going to show our upcoming fall community based courses. As you can see, we have these across different schools. Uh, we have a way for you all to search them too, assuming you you're looking to see what other faculty are or how other faculty in your school or department are uh, teaching community-based courses. And if you want to show what that, that looks like or one way to find that information, we do have a list posted and we can always send this list afterwards or include it as an attachment. And then there's a live list on Eagle service. So by going to the course catalog, selecting the filter for community-based learning, this is actually what ties in on the back end to GivePulse. So any of the courses that are designated as community-based will show both on Eagle service and on kind of the course catalog, and then have an associated GivePulse course created with it, which is a little bit of what we'll show you later on. Yeah, but what you can see here is I'm just on the, the AU course catalog, and the only filter here that I've applied is the fall 2023 filter. And then when you scroll down on this left-hand side to course types, you're able to select from the list of course types community-based learning right here. And this will update your filter so that all of the courses that are currently showing are community-based courses. Um, you can see we have both graduate and undergraduate level courses, and you can select by that. You can also pick by, um, by instructor if you're looking to see which of your colleagues are teaching. And then you can show um, the subject areas as well. And so if you have any interest in searching by department, then that's a great way to do that as well. When it comes to our role as members of the Center for Community Engagement and Service, also known as CCES or CSES, uh, we do a few different things to support the community-based learning process. So one of the first is we facilitate the community-based course designation, as well as an additional add-on credit called the Community Service Learning Program. We review community-based syllabus to ensure eight criteria that are set by the registrar that kind of uh, raise the bar or meet the standard of community-based learning are met. We submit that community-based designation for you, ensure that the course is present on Gift Pulse and provide semester-long support, as well as uh, host a community of practice. 
We also support community-based courses and the idea of community-based teaching to students, advisors, faculty. The ways we support faculty directly are tying the Canvas course to GivePulse, uh, giving access to different community-based learning resources and professional development opportunities, uh, providing financial resources, which we'll mention uh, on the next slide. And then uh, we also support students through doing class presentations. If you want um, me or Josie or somebody else from our office to come in and speak to your class about ways that your students can develop as leaders through service learning or community-based learning uh, or get involved with honors and recognition, then we're happy to come into your class, do a 15 or 20 minute presentation, provide some materials and give some context behind other programs in our office. We also ensure that hours are tracked and verified and then eligible for different awards like that President's Volunteer Service Award, which we'll mention a little bit more later. And, and last but not like least- I'd like to add, Sagar, something else that we just talked about recently is that they are um, verifying through like the academic code of conduct that uh, falsifying your hours associated with community-based learning or any type of service-related um, course is like an issue that needs to be verified. And so um, students that don't have hours that are able to be verified somehow can run into a problem. And so that's another thing that we've been able to, to kind of um, sure up on as well on this side. Yeah, the, the preservation of the integrity of the data that we're, we're hoping to track using GitPulse. Right. Uh, and then lastly, the managing of nonprofit relationships. So connecting different organizations to faculty and students and onboarding nonprofits onto gift polls and providing them resources on how to approve hours, verify them, et cetera. So next slide, we have a few of our financial or fiscal supports that we have for, for faculty. Uh, this is actually something run by a fellow faculty member, Amanda Chowka, who is our CSES faculty fellow in community-based learning. So a few of the different examples of something that can be um, accessed through these funds are micro grants, where as you're doing a final presentation of the community-based work that was done in your class, you're able to apply for funds for posters, for food at the final, uh, presentations. If you want to invite the community partner there, there's also honorariums for and for paying for that community partner's time, uh, whether it's at the end of the semester or at the beginning of the semester. And then there's also a little bit of money for travel and transportation, where if students are visiting the community partner's site and it's not metro accessible or accessible, um, you know, in in a way that's convenient for really the students are for the course, we're able, they can apply for a uh, transportation fund in the form of a lift grant. So on our next slide, we have some examples of different ways that nonprofits can, nonprofit organizations can work within different community-based courses. And so we've listed a few of these here. We're always happy to share these afterwards. I won't spend too much time going through this, uh, but overall, just to kind of um, give a brief overview, community outreach capacity building, doing research or advocacy initiatives, and then consulting. These are a few different ways that we see or have seen faculty conduct community-based courses um, over the past few years in a way that's either project-based or hours-based. Again, as community-based faculty, most of you will have probably engaged with some of this. I know uh, firsthand I've seen the branding or digital content that's come around that community outreach piece, uh, the virtual fundraisers from capacity building, the research, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, and advocacy work in terms of uh, the storytelling aspect or researching legislation and creating a policy brief, as well as doing almost program consulting or management consulting. So these are all ways that different faculty currently are, are engaging within nonprofits. So moving into the side of GiftPulse, and really that's, you know, I know why most of you are, are here. What is GiftPulse? What's its benefit? So GiftPulse is an online tool that centralizes service learning, the service learning experience for nonprofit students, faculty, and administrators. It supports how courses are set up within, uh, how community-based courses are set up. So one of the first benefits there is that the rosters are automatically synced 
based off of the information that's in colleagues. So say you have a student that's um, coming in to the class during the ad drop period or somebody who leaves, your course within Canvas is updated. And similarly on Gift Pulse, you will only see those students who are actually participating in your course. Thank you for those of you who piloted our gift post last year where we had to do more of a manual import or sync. Uh, now we've gotten this upgrade where everything will happen automatically and there's no extra effort on your end as faculty member to um, add in your students. That will all be done automatically. What we do want your input on though is the type of course. So we can set up courses in two ways, either as a project-based course or an hours-based course. So that's something that as we do our onboarding survey and as Josie meets um, with you all to understand the way you want to conduct your course, we will indicate it as project or hour on our end, but it shouldn't change the overall experience that, that you're working with. Next, in terms of connecting with partners, it allows you to find new partners, it saves time for your current partners that you're working with, and it allows partners to put in their own requirements so that as they're going through trying to build a relationship with you, uh, they can set any sort of uh, waivers that they have or questions that they have for your students on the actual uh, volunteer registration form. And lastly, it also engages students more. So one of the benefits is that the GivePoll system comes with an app as well. And that's something that students can then take with them as they're going into the site in a way that helps verify hours or uh, do impacts as they're traveling back. So they can do a reflection rather than waiting to get home and having to type it up on the computer as a separate assignment. We can have that information um, or students have access to that information at their fingertips. It then kind of facilitates the co-learning process because it puts the partner at the center it tags the student's interest so students can say if they enjoyed an opportunity uh, when it was with food insecurity or working with a certain organization, it will, um, they can add that to their profile and it'll show them other opportunities and ways to get involved. So in terms of some of the other uh, more administrative sides too, it streamlines the tracking of organized data, allows us to verify the impacts and build visual reports, which is something that we'll show you a few examples of in a few moments. And then it enables faculty to repeat a similar partnership across terms or sections. And it also advances how partner feedback can be collected and analyzed. If you have a TA or a PA, you can set certain fields within uh, the survey function on GivePost so that you can view certain fields and your TA could view either all of the same ones or if you wanted to keep some data sensitive, uh, you can most definitely do that. You could send then that same feedback form to multiple different partners, collect all of that data in one spot, see it year over year and how that data changes year over year. Um, and it really just should save time in terms of collecting feedback from your students, nonprofits, et cetera. Uh, every function that you have in Microsoft or Google Forms, you would have through gift pulse surveys as well. And with the added benefit of uh, kind of seeing that historical record of it tied to the partner. And you can also send out an email to them through gift pulse actually, if they haven't completed the survey, you could send a reminder to just those who haven't completed the survey. So who benefits from gift pulse? Really all four of the, part, the kind of stakeholders of community-based learning benefit from Gift Pulse. So for students, it generates a co-curricular transcript that works with the system Engage, uh, which is where students are doing their club involvement or uh, extracurricular involvement. So besides anything that you would see in um, on the academic transcript, what's nice about Gift Pulse is that it will, it will take anything that the student is doing outside of class, whether it's a community-based course, an add-on credit, a uh, club that they're doing service hours for and collect it all in one space. And at a click of a button, a student can generate that transcript and um, keep it and see it updated over time. The app, as I mentioned before, allows them to take their community-based courses, clubs and passions on the go. They can find new organizations to get involved with and clubs that are 
working in kind of something similar. So say you're teaching an environmental community-based course and uh, you and a student wants to get involved, like has gone to an opportunity at, let's say the Rock Creek Conservancy, and they're looking for other ways to get involved with Rock Creek. They might actually see a group of students from a club who are um, doing an event and join in on that straight from Gift Pulse, which really just builds that community aspect of service and uh, engages them more with the, the university campus. Lastly, hours are verified and they can be recorded to multiple programs. So when it comes to some of our programs like the Community Service Learning Program or the President's Volunteer Service Award, students are able to not only tag the hours to the courses itself, but it has the added benefit of being able to automatically tag those hours towards the President's Volunteer Service Award, or if they're doing a, C a CSLP out on credit, it would tag it to that as well. For faculty, there's also a ton of benefits, and really this is where we would focus most of our time on, the integration with Canvas, as I mentioned, the roster syncing, automatic reflections on all of the impact forms, which will show you how to create and make, and then no separate tracking. I know some of you have been teaching community-based courses for a long time and know the experience of having to track all of the information in a separate Excel sheet and then ask the students to corroborate that data and ask the partners to corroborate that data. The hope is that none of that will be needed and that will all be in one spot where you, your students, and your nonprofits can all have access to that. It's flexible by course, whether it's a project-based course or an hours-based course. You can repeat templates across sections, across terms um, for both the course itself, volunteer events, or surveys. And then it allows you to visualize the impact for things like annual faculty reports, or if you just want to share to your students, what were you able to accomplish in this one community-based learning class? Um, it, it will show you a few ways on how to do that. And lastly, with partnership formation, uh, finding new partners, partners can see the data and it's really reciprocal in nature again because the partners have a, a, an ability to actually post the events themselves. Our community partners have really enjoyed this for the reasons that it allows them to have all of their volunteer shifts in one place and when the student actually gets to the site they can be almost like a check-in attendant where on their phone they would see everybody who's supposed to be there on site that day and they can actually swipe to just check them in and that's it. The hours are verified. There's also automatic ways to do this through um, geotagging, which you know is more of an advanced function, very easy to set up, but one that we can explain uh, later. Another one of the big benefits to our nonprofit partners is that it allows nonprofits to advertise volunteer opportunities to a larger audience. So. It's not only American University that uses GIFPOS, GW uses it, uh, George Mason, Montgomery County College, um, and more un universities around the DMV are kind of transitioning over to GIFPOS. So when a nonprofit is looking to fill up event uh, volunteer spots, it's very time intensive to just be working on multiple different systems. So this is one way as a kind of a community of, um, DC or DMV schools, we're able to make that process a bit easier where a nonprofit can host that shift to multiple different organizations, uh, different universities. And it allows them to collect the volunteer data that they would need for grants or impact reports to um, board members or donors, et cetera. For us as staff, it's really useful because we don't, we then have a a view of what's going on throughout the entire semester without having to kind of ask. So less emails is really what that boils down to, um, which I know should be a welcome relief for everybody. It centralizes the data on the institution and community partner relationships. So sometimes we hear from nonprofits where their students who are volunteering with them and they were from a different program, but they assumed that it was from a community-based course. So hopefully this would avoid confusion in that sense. And it allows for a streamlined transition year over year or semester over semester for community-based courses. And you know, also gives us the data that we need to advocate for more you know, benefits for our uh, community-based learning faculty or students. This is just a, a brief overview of what we're about to dive into and what Josie will show you. Um, 
embedding course projects, that it's very accessible to students, and that it's a time saver for faculty. And again, this is all now something that we've set up. You'll be able to, uh, not on today's call, but pretty much on the one-on-one, -on -one, uh, walk through how to set this up on, on like with your class specifically. And um, there'll be some aspects that you can practice today on the call. Awesome, thank you, Samer. So now we'll start on the walkthrough and I'm actually gonna switch these points one and two quickly. And we're gonna talk about the impact form reflection because then I can exit the PowerPoint and not have to re-enter it again. So what we're able to do with GivePulse is provide students a single place where they're logging all of their service hours. And what that log looks like for them is this form right here. So the, the basic form includes um, this section right up here, this first question that lets them tag their service to your course in the first place. So that's what they would be doing to indicate what it is that um, they're trying to log to. They're able to put the dates in and they're able to put the time, the amount of hours that they completed. So these are just key for keeping track in general and also for verifying again on the backside. And then here students can rate their experience and this is a reflection section that's just open um, about their experience. So a lot of times for our CSLP students who were, were, were the ones that are administrating the program experience for them, I like to prompt students to write you know, a reflection of like what they physically did during that service experience so that they're able to remember um, anything memorable that stood out to them, something funny, something that left a long-term impression and something that connects deeper to their course or that they um, want to reflect further on and think about or something they learned is another good example. Then the personal notes section is private, only viewable to the student. So if something happened during that time period that they try to remember or they need a note for themselves for the future, they're able to leave that in the personal notes section. Then they're also able to add attachments. So if they have photos from that um, experience that are taken with permission from the nonprofit and everyone involved, of course, um, they're able to upload those here. And then finally, they're able to share that with um, the American University group. And then if they have um, a nonprofit partner that's already on GiftPulse, they're able to share that as well so that the nonprofit is able to see it. And then they click the Add Impact button and this whole process takes like two minutes, maybe three if they're writing a couple sentences. So this is the baseline impact form and pay attention to this just mentally because as um, an administrator of your course, you'll be able to make changes to this form. You'll be able to add in questions um, that are customized to your course based on what you would like to hear from your students. And so, if you, you know, spend the next few minutes as we get to that section thinking about what kinds of questions you would want to ask your students or, you know, um, like make one connection based on some course material that we discussed this, this week, something like that, that might prompt your students to reflect a little bit more deeply or that would guide their reflection a little bit more specifically. So with that in mind, we're going to switch over to um, looking at the Give Pulse integration, and I'm going to do it from the Canvas perspective. So I'm going to pretend like I'm one of you all here as a faculty member looking at my course, and this is the process that I would go about to sync Give Pulse to my course. So here you should all be looking at my Canvas home screen. I found out I have 30 hours of reading assigned each week already based on the classes that are just present here. So pray for me this year. Um, but this is a course available to CB faculty. We'll include this in um, an email afterwards, the link to register for this course that provides a lot of really great resources um, for faculty members. And this is the course we're gonna be using as our test course today. Uh, I will also add quickly that we have um, this AI website that we've recently discovered to be a miracle um, called Scribe, if any of you are familiar with it. And pretty much if you do a step-by-step -step tutorial, it follows all of your button clicks and takes screenshots of all of the steps that you are doing during your recording process. And that way you're able to um, 
like upload step-by-step -step tutorials really easily. And so you all will have access to these tutorials that we've made over each of the major steps that we're going over today. Um, and we'll share those with you in an email afterwards also. So I'll come down to the settings section here and it's gonna load for me. And then I'm going over to the navigation button and I'm gonna see that down here in my disabled pages, have Give Pulse. Now, every course at American University has Give Pulse available in the disabled pages. We ask that you don't move this Give Pulse section quite yet, that you wait to do this until later, because our backside data sync isn't yet complete from the colleague perspective that would automatically upload all of your um, roster information and that would update that. Um, if you were to do this step early, then pretty much what happens is you'll create a duplicate of your course and the version that you'll have won't auto sync with your student list. And so you'll end up having to do a lot of funky stuff to kind of undo that problem. So just sit back and enjoy the view for now. And um, you're able to, to, once we let you know that the data sync is complete, complete you're able to um, start doing these steps. So here I would click the enable button and that's enabled Give Pulse to now show up on my left-hand navigation sidebar. And then you can just drag this in wherever you want. So let's say I want it to show up right between home and announcements on the left side. And then very important for a lot of steps today is to remember to hit the save button because there's not a lot of auto save that is gonna be happening here. Then here I can view Give Pulse. And it's going to take a second to load while it creates the course for me because I don't have a course I'm attaching to this already. And as you can see, um, that sync is complete already. So from the faculty perspective, this is going to be your key, um, like managing home screen for all things Give Pulse. So I'm going to start by creating an opportunity for my students to upload their hours into. So. I know a lot of you are working with multiple nonprofits. Um, the, the key here is going to be making one event per group of students that you have. So let's say I have um, two nonprofits. I'm working with Horton's Kids and I'm working with Martha's Table as my two nonprofits. And half of my kids are, in, um, are at Horton's Kids and then half of them are at um, Martha's Table. So here I would go under events. I'm gonna click the add event button and we're gonna give it a second to load. And then here I would just create the name for it. Um, let's see, our submission. Okay, so if this keeps happening, there we go. All good, okay. so. I'm going to show you this in a different view. This won't be happening. This is like the data sync issue that's happening here. So this won't be an issue for you all when you are going about um, this page. But pretty much what you're seeing from that perspective is an insert of the real Give Pulse page. And so we'll just go about it from the Give Pulse page point of view so far. And your course would be, this is our test DB course that I've been messing with all the past couple of weeks. So the view that we just saw is gonna be right here. So you won't have to do any of this. This is just troubleshooting real quick. Mm. All right, we're gonna we're gonna restart this real quick. Give me just a second. Okay, so this is the view that's inserted into your Canvas page. So again, just like we just saw, we're going to events, add event. And this is just gonna be happening directly through Canvas. Then here, 
Okay, so this I guess is the error. This, this is the the give false um website down sauger that we were having earlier. So yeah. I'm gonna pull up the scribe version of it that I made and we're gonna just scroll through there. And so a lot of the process that Josie's going through at the moment too, we've documented uh, using this tool called Scribe. So Josie's going to show that we can actually share the link with you directly so that anything, you know, if you have any questions about any of the individual pieces, whether it's adding events, accessing your course, syncing it, we have a step-by-step -step with like kind of screenshots, et cetera, uh, guide for each part of that. So all you would have to do is request that from either Josie or I, and we can get that to you uh, and even assist you with setting it up for the very first time. Okay, so this is like a screen, this is a screenshot version of what we just saw. So um, again, we're clicking on Give Pulse on the left. We're clicking on the events button on the left. We're picking add event from the drop down, And then here we're gonna title it. So the biggest thing here again is you're gonna divide by your community partners. So if you're um, if you're picking, you know, I'm I'm saying that this is the Horton Kids opportunity. I'm gonna just clarify in the title so that when students are going to select where they're logging their hours to, they know they're logging it to Horton's Kids. And then you can add the assignment description as well here. If your students are picking their own partner and you're not picking from a list then you can just leave it open hours and the students will connect with the partner on the back end through their end and we'll need to enter your class and and do like a five minute presentation on that to to teach them how to do that but that's pretty easy to do so then you can add the description make that whatever it is that you'd like to add then i'm going to ensure if i'm an hours based course so we're going to look at the hours based version first project based courses are going to run a little differently if it's hours based i'm going to click on the volunteer and ensure that it's a volunteer event that i'm opening up and then i'm going to make sure that it's an ongoing volunteer event then at the bottom of this page it's going to say save and continue we'll save and continue then the participants needed number doesn't really matter. Um, you just need more than you have students in your class. So I just put like 500 on this just as um, as uh, a way to as a way to level it. And then to add an address, um, if you do know the site location where your students are going to be going, it's great if you can add that so that we do have documentation of like where in DC students are going. If you don't, just put um, the AU address in and that should be um, perfectly fine. Again, also, if you have instructions on how students should get there, leaving that in the address notes is um, another good place to do that. So if they need to take um, you know, the blue line and get off at you know, whatever stop, then that's a good place to leave that note. And then save and continue again. And then here, there's gonna be, there's this left-hand navigation bar that's up the entire time. We're just gonna skip past some of the extra settings that we don't care about per se right now. And we're gonna to go to the impact settings. And then again, this is what I was saying about um, creating an opportunity per nonprofit. And then we'll, we'll tag each of them on the backside here. So when it says share impact, you're gonna start typing the name of your nonprofit in here and their name will pop up and then you can just click it. And that way, Every time a student adds an impact um, or logs hours, it's automatically shared with them for them to verify and say, yes, like your student came and did this with me. So then that's just, you know, one of our clubs I picked as an example. Then um, there's a bunch of different impact types that you can make. Um, so feel free to deselect any of the types your students won't be doing. So. Um, you can leave up usually training, time, research, other if you want. Um, it's up to you. It's not that big of a deal um, at the end of the day. Time, for if your students are doing hour based is most likely. And if they're doing a training in order to do their service, they can just log that as time as well. Then save and continue again. Then this is the impact form creation field. So automatically, those questions that we looked at earlier are automatically going to be 
um, assigned to your students when they're filling this information out. But if you want to ask another extra question that's specific for your course, then this is where you would do it. So for example, you know, let's say I want a text area, I'm gonna drag the text area question field up into um, the box, and then I'm able to label that question from there. But there's quite a few different types of questions, and so they're pretty easy to drag back and forth. Then I'm just gonna um, label the question, you know, like ask the question. Um, feel free to make this required um, if that's, you know, what your expectation is. And then save. This is really important because the save bar button is like a little bit inconspicuous, but you need to make sure to save because otherwise it doesn't save it and then it's, it's kind of sad. And just to add in here a little bit, when it comes to building out some of the forms like impact questions, this is something where a community of practice can play a really big role because uh, when we create the impact questions, you're actually just able to add from an existing question as well. And that's shared across our faculty. It's the same thing as when we're creating a survey, as I mentioned before, where you could get partner feedback or uh, feedback from students in this way of a reflection form. If say you and your department and your uh, peers who are teaching CB in your own department have a few questions that you all would want to ask across courses, there's uh, you can just pull in those same questions, not have to create new fields or create new surveys. So there's a nice collaborative element to this, whether you're trying to share a survey um, for feedback forms or a reflection survey, like an impact reflection like this. Exactly. So then what's gonna happen is we're gonna hit the publish button up here on the top. And that's gonna submit the first event. So then what you're gonna wanna do is you're probably wanting to make multiple of these per community partner. So let's say I just finished the Horton Kids one and now I wanna do one with Martha's Table. So I'm gonna go back to the events button up on the top left. And I'm gonna see that I have the event listed right here. And there's gonna be this little drop down by the actions. And in that drop down is a button that says duplicate. And you're gonna just push the duplicate button. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna rename the name. So you, you might leave it the same, but you might just change the name of the community partner that you're doing here. And this is going to copy all of the information that you've already done. So all of the dates, all of the addresses, the community partners you've tagged, the impact questions you have asked are all exactly the same throughout here. So don't forget to update the address as needed, because um, if your community partner, if you're changing the name of the community partner, then probably they're at a different location. So make sure that you've made that change if you need to. And then we'll hit the save and continue button. And then on the impact settings here, I'm gonna hit the X button and that's gonna get rid of the impact of the original nonprofit that I tagged in the original event that I made. And then I'm just able to search for a new one. And every um, nonprofit that's in Give Pulse will show up here. Um, and I can just add in my new nonprofit that I'm picking here, hit next. And then we'll just hit the save and continue button. And then you just hit publish again, hit okay. And that was that. So then you have those two events that are created. Um, sometimes people have students that do a one-off project on their own. So maybe um, all of your students are working with these two partners, but then you have one student that's on a different timeline. You can just go ahead and make a separate event um, that says like other or like extra or, you know, that's for that student specifically. And then that's a way to isolate their impacts from the rest of them, of the students impacts. And so we're able to see more easily than what that process looks like. And then we're going to go back and look at the other one that I made for and, project base. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. And this process in terms of creating uh, events, right? There's the, I mentioned earlier that there's also that um, kind of nonprofit centered approach first, where we've at the moment recommend since it's kind of a, a 
new jump for a lot of you. It might be nice to kind of play around with it yourself, feel what it's like. Um, that said, nonprofit organizations may also already have events created. And if they have an event created, then some of this process, uh, they can actually just essentially share that event with you and you could add it to your course as well. So this is kind of like the, the primary way to go about this, but as we have more of a foundation of nonprofits who are actively using this platform, we will be able to have it where it's even, um, you know, kind of a nonprofits creating the event and you're just adding it to your course if you choose. Yeah. And it'll also be easier as you um, do this across multiple semesters and as you keep consistent community partners, it's really easy to create like templates that you can just use over and over again um, for the assignments that you're that you're trying to get from your students. And so um, that's another thing that we'll introduce kind of further down the line as we're um, as we're all getting more and more familiar with this process. So then if you're a project-based course, it's gonna look very similar to the event-based course. So um, again, just to review, we're starting with the Give Pulse button on the left of the Canvas page. We're clicking on the Events button. We're gonna click Add Events. Then we're gonna name the opportunity that we're creating in the title section. Again, labeling the community partner that that group is working with. You're gonna give a project description here. Then what you're doing instead of clicking volunteer is you're clicking project. And that's gonna change the way that the format exists in um, the impact system. And then this way students are gonna be prompted to complete milestones as opposed to ongoing hour requirements. And so um, then going forward, save and continue. Right on this left-hand side, we're gonna skip over all of the extra settings and we're gonna to go to the milestone section. And this is where you're able to build out what those milestones look like for your students. So you'll click actions on, on the top there and then you can add and you're gonna just add, I would recommend adding one milestone at a time. When you add multiple, it can get a little confusing. Um, feel free to play around with it if you'd like. Um, but if you're not doing like a million milestones, then doing, you know, if you're if your students are checking in six times, doing them one at a time is not that difficult. But if you have like a weekly occurrence, then that's when it might be more appropriate to add multiple at a time. So here you're going to name what the milestone is. Maybe it's like, you know, partner one check in or something like that, and a brief description of what the event is. Um, these are already assignments built into the course a lot of the times like you already have deadlines for students to complete this is just a um, a new way of of kind of tracking those and then keeping track of the time commitment associated with each of these milestones that students are using and then here you're going to edit the dates so you can edit the start and the end date here um and so that's important that's like you know when when it's going to be open and available to students and then when you're expecting it to be due by is what your end date is gonna be for that milestone. The project will mean, remain open up through the end of the, of the last milestone, pretty much is the way that works. Um, then we'll hit save and continue. Um, then from here, the add impact questions, this can be a little confusing. There's add impact on the top right, and there's also add impact on the left navigation bar. When you do add impact on the left navigation bar, that's adding impact questions to every single impact that all of your students add, as opposed to doing it per milestone. So if you're making, if you wanna ask students the same question at every single one of the milestones, then feel free to do it the same way that we did it in the events field when we go from the left-hand side. If you're trying to add a specific milestone, impact question, you want to do that from this top little bar up here that says add impact question. Then it's the same like we saw earlier, you're able to pick from the drop down what you would like to select, able to drag it in there, 
make the edits that you want. It's the same types of questions that are available. So um, there's not really any big difference here between projects and, and events. And then save and continue. And then here, this is taken us back to the milestone page that we started off at originally. Um, here, when we click the actions button, we can add another milestone. So let's say, you know, I have four check-ins. I'm going to be doing this process four times over. So then we're adding our second milestone. We're doing the title. We're editing the dates. You'll notice that the start date for the second one is the end date of the first one. So it automatically updated your start date here for you. And then again, we're adding the impact questions. If we have different questions we're trying to ask during our second milestone, we'll do that up here from the top button. Save and continue. And then we'll just click the publish button. And this publish button from here will publish the entire project. So that's then in order to um, you duplicate projects the same way that you do events, you know, that little drop down button. And again, we'll share all of the link, the step by step links with you um, after we've completed this. So that makes it easy to go back and forth between. Um, between um, like events that you're trying to create and, and to duplicate um, between um, community partners. That's the word I'm looking for. Okay, so that's a quick overview on creating the hour and project-based events. Again, if you have um, any questions about any of this at all, um, we're happy to walk you through this process as well. It's, there's a lot of, ability to personalize within this. This is kind of just the simplest, most straightforward way that we've shown. Um, and so like this is kind of the bottom line way to go through. There's a lot of information that you can get kind of sucked into. But if you're into that, like go for it and go crazy. And if you find something that works really well for you, please share that with us because we'd love to be able to share it with others. Um, so um, as you're comfortable, we would encourage you to play around a little bit in Give Pulse and find out what exactly um, you enjoy being able to use. Okay, now we're going to try to go back to give polls to talk about um, what um, what viewing student submissions looks like. So let's hope that it's happy with me this time. And I can give a little context as to you know where the is coming from currently so uh, the what's happening is that colleague where all of the student data is stored is moving towards you know um give pulse and so that's where that automatic roster sync comes in it will also allow us to understand a few of information around students like what is everybody's grade level or the school that they're in etc so that we can see how is service learning happening across the campus when we're looking at each of the individual students so you know I know in the past what we've done is just ask how many students do you have in your class now we're able to take a much deeper look and see what's everybody's majors or are they uh, going for master's program too are there any things that are making these students special in um, in more of a, a, an individual way. In order for us to get to that point, we have to involve our IT team. And there's this thing called uh, SFTP, Secure File Transfer Protocol. And it's something way above my pay grade and it requires a lot of uh, kind of like of a time investment initially. And right now our um, Secure File Transfer Protocol lead is on vacation. So when they are back next week, that's when we should be able to see the can your individual give post class uh created for that's like linked to your canvas course so when we send out the follow-up email um where we'll include the community of practice we'll include some of these onboarding slides we'll also say hey you can now try these steps uh and register the canvas connection with give pulse and everything should should be working very smoothly by then yeah so I'm going to skip over currently the um, student submission viewing because that happens directly through Gift Pulse. They host all of that information. Um, and instead, I'll show you how to integrate assignments from Gift Pulse into Canvas. 
So the way that this works is again, really straightforward and can be built into assignments that you already have established. So that's one of the very nice things about it. Here, let me share my screen with you. Okay, so again, I'm on the same page here where I have this give pulse section, but let's say I go home and I'm looking at all of, actually, let's look at all of the modules and let's say we have this um, assignment that we want to add into, um, into the community practice agenda right here. So we'll add an assignment. Here we go. We'll just say this is a test assignment. So imagine you already have your assignment built in that says, hey, you know, your hours are due. I'm looking to see um, maybe it's week six of the semester, and I'm looking to see that you have 10 of your hours done or something like that. Um, you're able to directly embed in here the link for students to log those hours. So under this little plug button, you're going to see Give Pulse as one of your pop, pop out options. And then here um, under your events, it's going to show um, your events that you've created. So it's going to show the the different, um, like, you know, the ones based on all of your, um, your nonprofits, or if you have any projects that you've created, those will show up here too. And it's possible to click, there's going to be right here also an add impact button. Um, here, we can actually, I think, do this from the group perspective also. So we can embed add impact here. Um, so actually, this might be a better way to do it. If you have if you have multiple events for your students based on, on their community um, partner that they're doing, I would actually, I would go ahead and go to the group button because then you only need to embed one link. And so we'll click this add impact button. And it's going to probably freak out on me. Um, oh, maybe not. That's exciting. And then this is going to be added directly onto the part of the assignment description that you've already uploaded. So then we'll do our little update thingy and we'll save. And uh, I don't want to jump the gun a little bit, but one of the places that when we're looking at, you know, kind of what's the, the future of this, how will everybody be able to collaborate within faculty um, if we go to edit and then that plug again I just wanted to point out something yeah, so sure. say so the way that this is going to happen on the back end is that we're grouping all of your courses by your schools or departments and so that's what these subgroup looks are and then we'll have an even larger one that's all of our community-based courses so as you're searching for your events um Nonprofits are probably affiliating or requesting to affiliate is probably more accurate because you get to approve whether or not nonprofit events will show up here. Uh, if they, you know, have one and they see your course and they're like, that might be a good fit. Let me see if I can affiliate with them and if they will, you know, join if we could partner together. So where you see some of these, um, and I'll put an arrow on the screen, if you see where there's these type of events or causes or skills, uh, those are going to be filters. And so say that you're right now a community-based course that has your students find individual community partners to work with for that experience, you may have a long list and you still want students to be tracking their impact on this, on this assignment side. Um, it will be pretty easy to then just filter by uh, public health or um, by the skill of graphic design, et cetera, so that it should, you know, kind of streamline that and allow you to share with your other um, peers a little bit more about what you're doing and what you've already created. 
for sure. And so then from the student perspective, it's really easy to just come through um, and and just click the add impact button that's going to open up that form that we showed you earlier on and all they have to do is add their reflection right right in there and it's directly from the canvas site they don't leave they don't have to you know um, import information from somewhere else and then you're able to view that on the back end and we'll have a nice um, visual for you about viewing um, viewing those impacts that students are logging and checking those hours and we're able to do that pretty pretty seamlessly from one place when students are able to use this add impact button. Um, for those of you that piloted for us, thank you. Um, that was really helpful in obtaining the software in the first place. And I know a lot of you had um, some challenges associated with getting um, students to add their impacts into the correct place. And this will make it much easier um, to do that as well. So I'll just return now to the PowerPoint. And we'll be able to look forward here. So uh, where we're going right now, too, I know that everybody is kind of muted with their videos off. I really am hoping to see uh, all of you all and have a little bit of a discussion about how we can truly leverage this, right? Because I understand that there's a bit of a shift. Hopefully, some of what you've heard today uh, seems feasible, seems inspiring that you can kind of like save time uh, by being able to duplicate the same system across different sections or terms, uh, find new nonprofits, have them put together their events and share those with you. And also you're an admin of your own section. So you would be able to kind of like give, uh, have control over it and, and visualize some of the information. So what you see over here are a few different reports that you would be able to generate with the click of a button or ask us to. And one of those is a heat map. Uh, it also could turn into a cluster map. You could click on any of these clusters and see all of the students who have contributed at what sites in that specific area, and then read the reflections by each student for that, um, which is really cool when you get to delve into that. You also get to see the different in, uh, the Nonprofits have each tagged their nonprofit to certain causes, and you'll be able to see a breakdown of those causes. You can also see a, um, a word cloud of the different reflections so that then towards the end of the semester, when you're recapping what was this as a CVL experience to your students, you can kind of pull on that before that kind of final presentation. Uh, so these are good post reports and where I would love to go and just hear more people's points of view on is, I, I understand, and this is where, again, I'm not in the provost side of things. So uh, I'm curious as to what are some of the data points that as you're conducting your faculty annual report might be useful for us to provide to you as kind of this nice give and take of, thank you for um, you know using the system, having data with integrity, how can we give this back to you in a way that then makes when you're creating that annual report for your department or for your school uh, easier so that you can include this kind of rich data that we're, we're able to collect? I, I'm not sure we, we get um, for our, our annual reports. I'm not sure we, the only section that I can think of where this is relevant is they ask for pedagogical innovations. And so something that's more blanket statement is helpful. Um, I don't know that we get any credit for, as far as um, academic affairs is concerned for participating in this program. But um, although there is a section on community involvement, so something like the, the total number of hours that were donated to or that students provided to a community partner is would be really useful. Um, I'm not sure if you can quantify impact, but certainly the number of hours, the number of students that were involved, um, the number of clients that were served. I, I'm not sure if you, 
if that comes out as well. Yeah, these are all things that we can kind of explore. And I think part of the strategy during our community of practice is going to be looking at more of a school by school approach, knowing that each school and dean does the annual report a little bit separately. What we're hoping is to find opportunities where maybe currently that language isn't included of this is what we're looking for. But as we go into these uh, service learning practices and are realizing that there are a lot of benefits to it, and we're seeing those from other universities, the body of research for service learning is so strong in terms of a high impact practice, uh, one that increases retention rates, increases student engagement, et cetera, that we're hoping, you know, deans will start to include this within the almost uh, rubric or request when it comes to if you're if you're doing one of this and that will allow us to you know uh, hopefully have a spot in those annual reports or service learning, learning data if you're participating in that um, where it can be highlighted to to uh, wherever those are set sorry I'm just seeing the chat now oh we don't generate annual reports anymore okay I see yeah so the, the, these are some of the questions that I think Again, from a staff side, we don't have as much knowledge of, and this is really valuable input from the faculty. Um, I'll share just the screen on some of the following upcoming events. And we have about five minutes. So again, we'll probably still have some time um, afterwards. If anybody has other, you know, just feedback on what would be useful to know all right, so in terms of upcoming events. Um, hi, this is Barbara. Um, did I hear you say you expect our nonprofits to go into this system and be tracking student hours in this system? Because I'm pretty sure my nonprofits aren't going to do that. They don't have time to do that. Yeah, so we've, we actually have started this at the nonprofit level. And, and what we've found so far is that um, especially if nonprofits don't have time when, so there's kind of two approaches to it. One is that all of the steps that Josie outlined, that was the kind of intentionality of setting it up for the nonprofit. So we're able to do this process in a way where the nonprofit is minimally involved. That said, we're hearing a lot of feedback from nonprofits currently that are actually really thanking us for introducing them to the system because they're looking for ways to engage with universities and develop those partnerships. And right now it happens at an individual level. So by doing something where multiple universities are all connected, sharing resources, not having to meet with multiple professors or staff members, uh, we kind of provide this other route. The other thing to mention is that this is completely free for all nonprofits. So right now, they, a lot of them are already using some sort of tool to manage volunteers, collect the data, especially if they're getting funded through either, either major donations or grants. Uh, they have to record some of this data anyway. And this is part of that puzzle where if we're a community-based course, we're working with a nonprofit and we're giving them estimations of data and they're using that, there's occasional times where that you know, might not be the uh, preferred choice by those nonprofits. Again, each nonprofit is different. We understand that they're small, medium, and large sizes. Some of them have already invested a lot into a different volunteer management tool. This is kind of for um, the, the few thousand of them who are in that middle ground where they're looking to adapt and they're having a, a really great experience with it so far. And we but, take care of a lot of that on our end also. So you don't need to worry about that process. If you just send them our way, then we can do the troubleshooting on our end and, and set up a good system for that works for them and for you all. But isn't the onus on the students and, and the faculty member to keep track of the hours? I mean, I, I, I just know the under-resourced, overextended, understaffed, uh, nonprofits where my students end up, they, they're never going to have the time to start tracking student hours in a system. I, um, it's not expected of them, right? It's not required of them for our students to partner with, uh, let's say, little friends of peace that's working in after-school programs in some of the toughest 
classrooms in some of the toughest schools to um, de-escalate violence in Anacostia and other places. Yeah. They're, you're not expecting them to spend hours in this database, correct? So uh, this is this is kind of um, w- how I'd like to respond to that is all we're asking is to set up that meeting with us. If we meet with them, if they say, hey, this is not going to work for us, we have other routes. So we don't pressure anybody into joining the system or into doing it, but we do try to understand where are they right now? What are some of the other ways that this could streamline organizational needs? Um, So what we want to avoid is to just assume on behalf of the community partner, rather than allowing us who've spent a lot of time in the system to you know, talk to them. So it's just about um, operating not from assumptions, but through collaboration. And, and we have seen that work where, you know, I, and this isn't with Little Friends for Peace, we haven't connected with them yet, but there have been similar hesitations. And then after a discussion, they've actually, again, said, oh, this is actually really useful for us. We didn't realize that it could do this capacity. And now they're, they're using it for more things. So that's all I would say. It's not a requirement, but it's something that we hope to meet with them, get their feedback on, see if it would work for them. And if it doesn't, we have other routes to go about it. Thank you. Yeah, so I know we're at time. Um, we'll send over some of these upcoming events, but I know we'll see a few of you at the uh, faculty community partner brunch. All of the people at the brunch, by the way, will be using Gift Pulse. Um, same with the nonprofit networking fair. So that's 18 organizations to 20 organizations uh, at both of these events all across different disciplines. We have CSLP registration closing on September 11th. Classroom presentations are available. We'll send the link after. And we'll also send along the resources for your Canvas course as well. So thank you so much, everybody, for attending and staying with us during this time. Again, um, we're all invested here as practitioners and really hoping to make this a system that uh, allows us to build for the future.